How you guys doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you. I want you to stop for a moment and consider something. You are not here in this room this morning or online by accident. Stop to consider that from eternity past, God planned that you would be here today for a reason. You. Something he wants you to hear something he wants you to understand. I wonder what it is. You know, we're all different. We all have different beliefs, different opinions. We all have different perspectives. We all have different expectations. We all have different preferences. We have different preferences about books that we read, movies that we watch, music that we listen to, clothes that we wear, restaurants that we would enjoy eating at, vacation destinations. We're all different. I mean, let's, let's just take, for instance, movies. We all have different movies that we like. Some of you, you prefer a comedy. I mean, life's serious enough. If you're going to sit down and watch a movie for an hour or two, you want to just have a good laugh. And some of you, you like a good romance. Something where the heartstrings are tugged and people fall in love and live happily ever after. You love that kind of movie. And some of you, you like science fiction. You like futuristic sorts of ideas. Some of you, you're more the superhero type. You like Batman and Spider-Man and Iron Man and the Hulk and the whole host of them. That's more your flavor. Some of you, you might be reticent to admit it here at church, but you really love a good horror movie. I can't watch a horror movie. I can't. It scares the bejeebers out of me. (laughs) And I'm weird for like the next two weeks. I mean, I can't watch a horror movie. Some of you, you like a mystery. So on the very rare occasion that I have some time to actually sit down and watch a movie, and I'm, I'm choosing for myself, I'm not having to accommodate somebody else's preference or interest. 99.9% of the time, I'm going to choose between one of two types of movies. One is I'm going to choose a true story, even a documentary, because that's the way my mind works. I love it. doesn't matter what period of history. I like to explore things that might have actually happened that are true. Or I'm going to choose action and adventure, but... Along a certain line, I love a movie that has a high justice factor, you know, where the good guys overcome the bad guys, where the bully comes triumph over the bully, where the the little guy confronts the big machine. I, I love a movie like that. I love where wrongs are being made right. If a movie has somehow involves justice for somebody's dog, I'm into the end. I am into the end. I admit it. I'm a bit favorable toward vigilantism in a good movie now and then. Now, I almost always choose a movie that has something to do with a Navy SEAL, an Army sniper, a Special Forces operator, or some undercover agent. Those are my favorite kinds of movies. And if you've ever seen a movie like that, if you follow that movie, they have a certain pattern to them. And here's how it usually goes. The main character, the good guy, 
It usually begins in an office and he's sitting with like some, you know, political big wig or some military brass. And they're explaining to him that there's some bad guys doing some bad things at a bad part of the world and they have to do something about it to stop this. And they need somebody with a special set of skills. Because if somebody doesn't act, if somebody doesn't move, if somebody doesn't do something about the bad guys doing the bad things, the world's going to be lost. This is about saving the world. And then the conversation always involves that if you should choose to go on this mission, you need to realize that we're going to take every evidence that you exist and we're going to bury it so deep, it's like you've never been born. And if you find yourself in trouble someday, nobody's coming to rescue you. You are truly on your own to save the world. And then the next scene is what? There's some B-roll of an airplane taking off. <laughs> and then the next scene in the movie, the main character's in some deserted, arid, dusty, hot part of the world. And there's sweat up around his olive green T-shirt his cargo pants. He's always got a really cool watch and some sharp sunglasses on. You've seen this movie, haven't you? And he's carrying his bug out bag and he might pick up one suitcase and where you see him, he's at the customs office and he's turning in his new identity, you know, this passport with a fake photo and all the information. And then from that point on in the movie, everywhere he goes, Every person he meets, everything he says, every single moment of his life, whether he's awake or whether he's asleep, every single thing that he does is part of the mission that he's on. You've all seen this movie? Yeah. Now, listen to me. Most of us in this room, we can't even begin to relate to that kind of save the world urgency that's found in most Hollywood storylines. We, we, we have never lived anything like that. Now, a few of you have. You've been in some very dangerous places where your life has been on the line. But most of us, we, we can't we can't begin to imagine the life of, you know, like Jason Bourne or Jack Reacher or Ethan Hunt or Jack Ryan or Brian Mills or Bobby Lee Swagger. And then my new favorite, The Equalizer. <laughs> Robert McCall, played by Denzel Washington. We can't imagine a life like that. We've never been there. We'd never have to do that. But let me invite you to consider something here today, something that perhaps you've never, ever thought about a moment in your life. We're human beings. And for that reason, we're limited to the language that we understand. To try to describe big ethereal concepts like eternity and infinity and so whenever we start thinking about that God's always existed and God's always known and God's always been, we don't have language for that. And so the only way we know how to discuss the movement of God in history is we say that somewhere in the past, God decided to do something. That somewhere in human history, God decided to do something to address a very serious and enormous spiritual problem. God decided to help save the world. You see, the truth of the matter is that because of the impact of sin on humanity, all of us as sinners, we've been separated from God. 
We are not allowed to have a relationship with him because we in our sin and he in his holiness and his righteousness and his justice, he can't have anything to do with that which is unholy or that which is sinful and that us and that is us. And so we have been separated from God, but this broke his heart. This bugged him. And he decided he had to do something about it because he understood the stakes. He understood the equation. The equation is that human beings who die in their sin will spend eternity in a place that's real called hell. We don't like to talk about that. We'd rather not mention that. But that is the truth, and I'm only faithful to you as a pastor if I tell you the truth. And God understood the enormous problem that humanity like you and me, we faced in our sin, separated from him. So guess what God did? God came to earth on a mission in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus came to earth on a mission from God to save the world. Look at this. For God so loved the world, his heart ached so much for the plight of the world. God so loved the world that he sent his only son on a mission to do something, to save the world. That whoever, it doesn't matter what human being, no matter what they've done, no matter how many times they've done, that whoever would believe in this son that God sent, believe in him, should not perish, but they could could have eternal life in heaven, in the presence of God. And we love to talk about this part about eternal life, but I'd like to direct your attention to another part of the verse here this morning, and that is that they should not perish. The truth of the matter is about humanity is people are perishing. People without Jesus Christ, every single moment of their day are moving closer and closer to an eternity without God. An eternity in hell. And you're married to some of them. And some of them are your kids. And some of them are your best friends in life. And some of them are the people that you work with every day and you have developed an appreciation of them. That every person that you lay eyes on every day and shake hands with and rub shoulders with, they are perishing. And God said to his son, Jesus, I need you to go save the world. And Jesus leaves the comfort of heaven and he arrives here on this earth and he doesn't come undercover like some Navy SEAL. No, he comes as a baby born in Bethlehem. And he teaches us about eternity and he teaches us about faith and he teaches us about God's love and mercy and grace and the the gift of salvation. And then he goes to a cross outside of Jerusalem and he dies there as a payment for the sins of the world so that human beings can be reunited into a relationship with God, a holy, righteous, just God who will grant to them the forgiveness that they need in order to know a relationship with him as their father. And from the moment that Jesus arrived on this earth, every minute that he was on this earth was a part of his mission. Every person that he met, every word that he said, everything that he did, every place where he went was all a part of the mission that he was on. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. The world is already condemned. That's the nature and the impact and the severity of sin. 
He did not come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world through Jesus. That was the mission that Jesus was on, to save the world. Does that make sense? But the story doesn't end there. They made a sequel. There's part two, the continuation of God's mission to save the world. So this morning, I want to invite you, if you have your Bible with you, to come with me to the book of Matthew. If you're new to the finding books in the Bible thing, use the table of contents. That's what it's there for. No shame in that. Come with me to the book of Matthew. Follow along. I was gonna, I'm going to read to you three passages of Scripture. And as I read these three passages of Scripture and you follow along, I want you, I want you to ask yourself the question, is anybody in any of these passages being asked to do anything that sounds like a mission? So come with me to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Let's pick it up around verse 17. This is after the resurrection. The disciples see the risen Lord, and when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted. Some weren't quite sure what they were looking at. Then Jesus came to them, and he said, now listen, these are the instructions of the risen Jesus All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And surely I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. Go. And make disciples. Okay, you ready? All right, I'm gonna get fancy here today. Just go to your right, three more books. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then come to the book of Acts. The book of Acts. You're just gonna be turning your pages to the left, you're headed right, Acts chapter one. Look at this. Verse 8, you, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in the larger region of Judea and Samaria. In fact, to the ends of the earth, you will be my witnesses. Keep going to your right. Two books, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, three books. We're coming to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is like a brand new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. And all of this is from God. God, who's doing what? Who's reconciled us to himself, restored the relationship of us and him. How? Through Christ. And then look at what he did. He gave us, he gave us a ministry called reconciliation. Not a ministry of condemnation, a ministry of reconciliation. And here's what it is, that God was reconciling the world to himself. How? In Christ, by no longer counting people's sins against them. And just in case we miss the instructions, he repeats them. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. Please share the message of reconciliation. Look at this, verse 20. We, we are therefore Christ ambassadors. 
it's as though God were making his appeal to human beings through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, whatever you do, be reconciled to God. Because here's the beauty of the gospel. God made Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us so that we in him might become the righteousness of God, the great eternal exchange where God God puts on Jesus the sin that I'm guilty of and then took the righteousness that Jesus possessed and he gave it to me. Each one of those passages were written to Christ followers in the first century in whose steps we follow as 21st century disciples of Jesus. Those verses weren't written to pastors. Those verses weren't written to missionaries. Those verses, all three of them, they were written to anyone who professes to be a follower of Jesus. If you are a Christ follower, if you've placed your faith in Jesus and committed to following him, then he says to you, go and make disciples into all the world. He says to you and to me, to us, you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. He says to all of us, we are ambassadors. It's it's like God is making his appeal to the world through us. Does that make sense? You know, a few years ago, I knew a pastor. He was a big deal had one of the largest churches in America, had an international platform for ministry. And one of the opportunities that was presented to him and his exposure and his influence was an opportunity that would never be given to me. He had the opportunity to be a spiritual advisor to one of our presidents. This president specifically invited him to be in regular contact to help him sort out some of the spiritual burdens of what it meant to be a person who's the president. And I once heard him tell a story that he had had traveled to to Washington, D.C. for his meeting with the president. And he was ushered into this anteroom outside of the Oval Office where he was seated and asked to wait. There was only one other person in the room with him. Sitting across from him was a military officer dressed in his uniform who looked like he was very serious about why he was there. And this pastor observed that they both had briefcases. He had his briefcase, and it was his Bible and some work that he had been um, working on in his flight to Washington, D.C. The other, the other gentleman had an unusually large briefcase, and he had enough awareness to understand that that briefcase was not just any briefcase. That was called the football. The football, a briefcase containing all of the instructions and the devices needed for the president to launch nuclear weapons to anywhere in the world should an international incident occur that needs the protection of the United States. That football is never never further than just a few hundred yards away from the president at any time. And this pastor was explaining that he sort of looked at the two briefcases there and he's like, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. This guy holds the codes to bring death and destruction to the entire world, and he felt so diminished. 
And he sat there and reflected, and God began to work in his heart and his mind. He said, wait a second, what's in your briefcase? It's just a Bible. Just a Bible? Those are my eternal inspired words, revelation to mankind. Those are the words of life. Those are the words of eternal life. And suddenly he began to feel like, wait a second, I'm not diminished. I possess in my briefcase the eternal words of God. To share with anybody who is we willing to listen the story of Jesus come to the world on a mission to save it. And I wonder, do we recognize and understand who we are as Christ followers? Do we really get our place in the world? That the God of the universe has instructed you, instructed me, go and make disciples. You, you will be my witnesses in the world wherever the world may take you. You, you are my ambassadors. I want to make my appeal to the world through you. Do we really understand that? Every single Christian on the planet has been given a mission from God to help save the world from spending eternity in hell. That's you. That's me. We are on a mission. A mission of living for Jesus. A mission of loving people for Jesus. A mission of pointing people to Jesus. A mission of leading people to Jesus. That's our place in the world. But some of us, we can't imagine that. That's just so overwhelming. That's just so large and, and imposing. That's just so big. So, so, so let's be honest. Let's, let's quit talking about saving the world. Let's quit talking about saving the world, and rather than trying to save the entire world, let's just start walking across the street and inviting our neighbors to church. Because all of us can do that, because all of us have neighbors, people that we go to school with and people that we work with and people that are our friends, all of us. We can do that. And we have two really great opportunities on our doorstep to do just the simple act of inviting a friend to church. One is called Easter. And the likelihood that your neighbor or friend might say yes to an invitation to Easter to join you here at Cibolo Creek, the probability is so much greater because it's Easter. Or the second opportunity, because they might not be the type who would go to a church service. And, and I get that. So what if there was another opportunity? What if they could do something that all of us long to do, and that's just help other people? We have, a, we have another opportunity called Serving Sunday, and it's coming quickly. Where our church goes out into our community, and we just serve, and we just help, and we just be generous and gracious and kind to people in, in any practical way possible. And maybe your friends, your neighbors, your classmates, your, your, your friends from work, they'd be happy to join you for that. Just, just start there. So let me ask you a question. The question is this. Who's your one? Who's your one? Like, who's the one person in your life that your heart aches for? Who's the one person in your life that you are genuinely concerned about? Who's the one person that you would love to see come to know Jesus Christ in a vibrant and thriving relationship? Who's the one person that if God would so 
use you to help them find Jesus. You couldn't think of another thing that would be more exciting. Who's, who's your one? Did you know that this church was built on the one? Did you know that when we built this building, when it was still un- under construction, there was no carpet on the floor, it was just the raw foundation that hundreds of people at Cibolo Creek, they came into this room in the hallways and down our Kids Creek area and took markers and they wrote names all over this place. They're one. The person that they would pray for and the person they would intentionally build relationship with and the person they would take to lunch and take to dinner and take to breakfast and go fishing with and go hunting with and hang out with with the hope of building the kind of rapport that God might use them as an ambassador of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right now, you're literally sitting on top of hundreds of names that represent the one. A few years ago, a carpet got worn out and we... We pulled this carpet up and I just walked through here and I just looked at the hundreds of names. Maybe it's time that we lit the fire again at Cibolo Creek for the one. The one lost sheep, the one that truly matters to a God of grace and mercy who did not come to the world to save the righteous but to call sinners to repentance. Maybe it's time that all of us understood our place in this world, the mission that we've been given by the God of the universe to go and make disciples, to be witnesses wherever life takes us, to be the ambassadors of God who's making his appeal through us to those who are our friends and our neighbors and our spouses and our kids who are lost without Christ and without Christ will spend eternity in hell. So I'm inviting you to find your one. That one person that you will pray for every day that one person that you will beg God to please help you know how best to approach them and nurture the conversation with them about Jesus, the Messiah, the Messiah that they need. So at the risk of being really weird, it's time we get over that. I'd like spend some of the closing moments of our service here today doing something very intentional. And I invite you to to join us to any degree that you're comfortable. When you came into the auditorium today, you, you found two cards on your seats. They're identical. One of them has a string on it. I'd like to take a few minutes and give you the opportunity to prayerfully consider who's the name of the one person that I might follow Jesus toward helping them understand what it is to have faith in Jesus Christ. So on the card without the string, that one's for you. Just write the name of that one person. If you're nervous about somebody recognizing the name, just write their initials. Or if you're so nervous that somebody might recognize it, just make up a name. (laughs) You and God will understand. (laughs) Just write the name of one person that matters to you. And then use this card. Stick it in your purse or your wallet. Tape it to the dashboard of your car or the mirror in your bathroom or put a magnet on it and hang it on the refrigerator where where you would be reminded every day for the next three or four weeks until Easter or Serving Sunday to pray that God might use you to lead this person closer to an understanding of Jesus Christ. This other card... 
I invite you to write the same name. But here's what I'd like to encourage you to do with it. Again, you don't have to. You're invited to. I've invited the worship team to come and join us again here on the platform. They're going to lead us a song of reflection. And while we're singing in the moments of that song, would you consider cementing this decision to pray for this person in some sort of, you know, very practical exhibition of your intentions? That while we're singing, that you'd make your way to this cross here in this corner of the auditorium. On it, you'll find nails. And you would hang the name that you've written on that card on that cross, which will be there for the next several weeks to remind us every Sunday, oh, that's right, I committed to doing something. You don't have to, but would you consider doing something to move you off of dead center and intentionality toward owning a responsibility to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ for your one? Take it to the cross in a spirit of commitment, asking God to use you. Then come back to your seat. You will find there's not enough nails for every card, so just hang them on top of each other. You say, ah, I, 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 I can't do that. Okay, okay. So when I conclude the service after we've spent these moments together, we're just going to leave the auditorium in sort of a reflective mood and invite all of us to leave quietly. But if you want to stay for a few minutes, pray over your name, or then use that kind of anonymity to make your way to the cross, that'll be there for you. But please, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, pray for one. Let one person matter enough to the salvation that you enjoy that you would get involved and ask God to use you. As you pray, call on his name. He's going to sing a song over you. It says, oh God, my God, I need you. I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures for generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses, the one who opened up the ocean. I need you now to do the same thing for me. For me, for me. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now, how I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. on the God of Mary whose favor rests 
to imagine what God might see fit to do through you. To alter the entire eternal trajectory of a friend's life. Let's have the faith to believe God is still on a mission and he's invited us to be a part of it. Thank you. Let me pray for us and then again, I invite you to 
quietly make your way from the auditorium as there may be people who want to just continue to sit in this moment for a while and do business with God. Our Father in heaven, I can't help but believe. I can't help but believe that your heart is bursting because this is what you want of us to partner with you in the redemptive game plan of mankind who we know as our friends and our spouses and our kids and our relatives our associates at work and the people we run around with God, if you would so fit to use us to save the world, that's great. But may we be faithful at just walking across the street, inviting a neighbor toward you. I pray and ask this in Christ's name.